Ed Spa Marketing. I'm very excited to be covering this topic with you all of you today. I think it is something that is very timely, especially as we head into the second quarter. And I think you're really going to get some very tangible and actionable insights from our teachings today. So I'm very excited to have all of you here with me. So what we're really going to be talking about today and what I am so excited to cover with everyone today is how can we build a foundation that's going to really transform your med spa marketing into the second quarter and beyond. So I really want to make sure at the end of our 60 minutes or so together, you are empowered with actionable insights and very tangible learning that you can then apply as early as this afternoon to get better marketing results for the remainder of the year, right? I'm sure maybe many of you in your practices right now, you are looking at your marketing from the first quarter, maybe even over the past year, and looking at what's worked really well, what has not? What challenges did we face? What opportunities are there that we have yet to leverage? So I think what you're going to learn today is a lot different from what many other marketers in the medical aesthetic space may be sharing with you. And I think it's something that's really going to resonate. So very, very excited. Now, there's this old saying, and I really love it. It's that 80% of success is showing up. So I'm so excited to have you here or if you're watching the recording of this webinar later, that's great as well, right? How many medical aesthetic practices are in your regional market? How many medical aesthetic practices are there in business today? And how many of you actually are taking the time out of your busy practice schedules to watch this webinar and really join in, right? That tells me that you are committed to growing your practice and really committed to doing something differently with your marketing, which is great because, again, you know, there's a saying from Einstein, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over. And I see a lot of practices doing that, um, but that's not what we're here to do today. So really looking forward to getting into our content. Now, I do want to mention that I have a gift for you today. You know, again, I know how busy you are and you've taken time out of your hectic schedules um, to be joining me today. So uh, that's a gift that typically retails on Amazon for $18.97, but we're going to give it away to you today, complimentary, but we'll get to that towards the end of our broadcast. So not to worry. Now, a little bit about me. Some of you might not know who I am, but before we get into that and what I'm going to be teaching you today, let's do an overview. Um, I want to know today, you know, what are your challenges? What are your goals and opportunities where your marketing is concerned? Feel free to put those in the chat box. As far as what I'm going to be covering, we're going to talk about what most aesthetic practices are really doing wrong when it comes to planning their marketing and what you should be doing instead. Um, we're going to talk about the three phases that will really ensure your marketing plan success. We're going to talk about what specific strategies and what marketing channels you should be using in your med spa marketing and when to use these channels. And of course, we're going to talk about how you create a strategic marketing calendar. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. A few of the other things I do want to mention before we dive in is we're going to talk about the state of the industry. We're going to talk about what is a brand and why do branding and differentiation matter more than ever? And of course, how do we leverage strategic marketing and what that means for better return on your investment from advertising and what advertising channels might work best for your practice? So very exciting. So a little bit about me. Again, I know you may have heard about this webinar from a colleague. Uh, we had some of you join us through medical device companies. Uh, some of you may have found us through another colleague in the digital lead generation space. So very excited to have you here. My name is Adam Haroon, and I'm the managing director here at Branding MD. So uh, since I started my company, I've had the opportunity to really form some really great industry partnerships. I've 
spoken for Allergan. I'm a very regular speaker for Mertz. Uh, I've spoken for BTL Aesthetics. We do our own events as well. Um, I'm a frequent speaker at industry conferences. Actually, those of you who are attending AMWC uh, in Monaco this April, you'll be seeing me there. I'd love to meet you in person. So I just really love what I do. And, you know, there's nothing I enjoy more than really sharing my insights with practices and helping them grow and serve more patients. So very glad to be your host today. Um, just so you know what makes me a little different than some of the other marketing experts or consultants or subject matter experts you may have heard at conferences or spoken to before, or maybe that even work for you right now is I believe, and to my knowledge and based on my research, I am the only one in this industry who is speaking about branding, right? There's plenty of people talking about digital marketing, plenty of people talking about you know, analytics and referral programs and internal marketing. And those are all very important things. But what I want to help you understand is why we need to differentiate your practice and set you apart. And specifically, I want you to understand how that pertains to aesthetic practices. So we work exclusively with providers in the aesthetic space, whether those are practices such as med spas and surgeons who are only doing aesthetics, or perhaps you're a wellness center or a physician who primarily practices in another area, but aesthetics makes up a part of your practice, right? Anything relating to aesthetics, we can lend our expertise. So very glad to have all of you joining us. I know we've got some nurses, we've got some surgeons, some practice managers, many different roles and facets to the practice joining us today. And I think you're all going to be able to glean something from our content. So this is great. Perfect. So. Just like I said, this gift here is going to be a copy of my book, Now the Patient Will See You. It's $18.97 on Amazon, but we'll give you the digital edition free of charge at the end of today's broadcast. I'll tell you how to do that. And we're also going to make sure we can get you a copy of our slides today so you can refer to those uh, in the book as well to really further your learning. Great. Now, as I get started here, one thing I do want to mention is... I am a marketer and not a magician, so there's no silver bullet. I wish there was, you know, some kind of magic spell I could cast that would solve all of your marketing problems and, you know, have a stampede of patients coming to your door. But unfortunately, I don't know that. All I have for you today are best practices and strategies strategies that will work for your practice long term. We're not going to be rehashing anything you've heard over and over again, and we're not going to be talking about any kind of, you know, super trendy, here today, gone tomorrow type of marketing gimmicks, right? We really want to build a solid foundation. So if you were looking for a magic show, um, I'm so sorry, but you're on the wrong webinar. <laughs> Great. So where do we begin? Um, I wish I had all of you in front of me in an audience right now so I could see you all raise your hands, right? Anytime I do this on stage and ask this question, it's inevitable that almost every hand in the audience goes up. So how many of you, you know, ask yourself, would you agree that the medical aesthetic space is crowded and becoming more and more crowded every single day, right? So I'd like to share a stat with you that's a little troubling. Um, in their annual survey, this specific statistic is from 2017, but the 2018 statistics just came out from the ASDS. This is the American Society of Dermatologic Surgery. 50% of patients ran price as their primary buying criteria when they're looking for a cosmetic procedure, right? So that's troubling because it tells us at least half of your prospects, if not more, are not considering credentials of the provider. They are not considering the location of the practice. They're not considering the device or product used in their treatment. They're not even considering the patient outcome. What they're most concerned with is price, right? And that tells us that our industry has become increasingly, and this gets worse every single year, but is becoming increasingly commoditized, right? People see your practice as the same as everyone else. And you know just as well as I do, that's far from the case, right? Um, it's almost like when you think about it, people have really become more particular about who is doing their hair, right? Who their hairstylist is, than who is performing an aesthetic procedure. It's, you know, it's, if you are getting your hair cut, you want to talk to friends where they go, you want to look at their Yelp reviews, you want to look them up on Instagram, all of that, right? But when people see a radio ad or see a billboard or they go on Groupon or something and there is like a promotion for, you know, Botox or Dysport for, you know, eight, seven, 
seven dollars, seven eight dollars a unit, they go running, right? And it just it, it's craziness. <laughs> um, now, how did we get here, right? How did this happen exactly? Well, before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about where this leaves us, and it leaves us with what I refer to as a disconnect, right? And this disconnect that we see in the medical aesthetic space is really that we have so many incredibly skilled providers, whether they are surgeons, whether they are physicians, whether they are nurse practitioners or nurses, whether they are estheticians, we have so many skilled providers who do incredible work and give their, their patients remarkable outcomes. But unfortunately, they aren't as proficient or as comfortable with marketing, right? So they all ultimately get lost among all of the advertising noise and end up with either no marketing or marketing that is very commonplace, very uninspired, and fails to capture that prospective patient's attention. Then on the other hand, we have mediocre, you know, mediocre at best, to be quite honest, mediocre at best providers who have great marketing skills or a great marketing team behind them right? So they are prominent in the media. They're advertising very aggressively. They're getting all this patient traffic through their doors, but those patients are at best dissatisfied. At worst, they may have some very real complications, right? Because many providers, I hate to say it, but they don't necessarily put the patient's best interest first. And they're more concerned with, you know, their revenue and their profitability and, you know, making a quick buck. And those are all important things, but not when that comes at the expense of a patient satisfaction or safety. So this is kind of a disconnect I really do see in our industry across regional markets, across geographic markets, and it's something that I'm very inspired and frankly uh, determined to really shift the tide on. So that's the disconnect, and I think if all of you were on this webinar with me today, you find yourself perhaps in that first category, and so we just want to make sure the patient sees you, and we're going to go through a number of ways we can do that. Great. So the next thing I'd like to share a little bit of insight with all of you on is what separates a commodity practice from a distinguished practice, right? So when a practice finds itself as a commodity, what's usually happening is we see that this practice does not have a defined patient base, right? If you ask them, and I can't tell you how many times I've had this happen virtually verbatim when I'm on site with a client, uh, I ask them, you know, who is your best patient? And they will tell me, more or less, you know, anyone with wrinkles and a credit limit. Um, wow, <laughs> that is not defined enough. So they'll take pretty much anyone and everyone, right? If you look at their treatment menu, if you look at their offerings, they're probably virtually identical or perhaps even a cut and paste replica of their competition, right? There's nothing unique at first glance they're bringing to the table. Um, patients don't necessarily understand what makes a practice different if it's a commodity, right? They think, you know, a med spa is a med spa, a plastic surgeon is a plastic surgeon, um, they don't see the difference, right? And when patients don't see a difference between you and competitors, this often means you're going to have to resort to very rampant discounting, which is, you know, a terrible place to find yourself for any number of reasons. Um, if we take a look at the marketing materials and the logo and the branding of most commodity practices, it's maybe, you know, a silhouette or a face or a butterfly fly, right, or a lotus flower, heaven forbid. Um, it's all these very commonplace, overused visual identities that are just easily forgotten by a patient, right? If you look at their brochures in the reception area, it kind of looks like a yard sale, right? All these different brochures, some are made custom, others come from vendors, and a patient doesn't know, you know, what they should look at first, right? So that's another challenge I see with commodity practices. And finally, when it looks, you know, when I look at their marketing plan, it looks like they are either not marketing at all, or they're marketing, you know, quote unquote, but there's no real plan to it, right? They're kind of just tossing things into the air and seeing what holds, right? There's no real rhyme or reason to any of their marketing, right? So I would love to know, you know, is these, are these challenges any of you are facing? Does this sound maybe a little little bit like some of your practices. Um, if it does, don't feel bad. Uh, you're not, you know, alone. This is very, very common and it's exactly what we're going to be remedying with the insights I'm going to be sharing with you today. So don't feel bad. Now, how do we 
end up with such a commoditized industry, right? How did we end up that, you know, people see all aesthetic providers as pretty much one and the same? Um, I think there really are a couple of different reasons at play here, right? So the first is, you know, I call this the Kardashian effect, right? Rapid industry growth, right? Things have really grown and become much more mainstream in the past decade, even in the past five years, right? So it's a much more crowded field now. And like I mentioned a moment ago, not all of these providers have the patient's best interests at heart. Um, another reason I think we've become commoditized is complacency, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, those of you who've been in practice longer, you know, looking back five or 10 years ago, if you were just able to put up a radio ad, you know, put a quick website together, maybe do a little bit of very modest paid advertising on Facebook, um, ultimately that was enough and you would get patients through your door. But in today's market landscape in 2019, good is no longer good enough, right? So if you don't stand out, you are invisible. I'm going to say that again. If you don't stand out, you are invisible visible in today's industry landscape, right? Complacency is almost the kiss of death when it comes to your lead generation. So that's another reason we've become commoditized. Group buying sites, um, my personal favorite, I think, <laughs> uh, you know, whether it is Groupon or Living Social or whatever you happen to have in your local market, again, the, you know, the prevalence of these sites is different from one region to another, but it's affected us industry-wide that people have almost become trained to look for a deal and shop on price than they have to seek out the best provider for their individual needs. So that's another factor. And then, of course, vendor-supplied marketing collateral and medical marketing companies, right? I'm going to put these in the same basket for a moment. So, you know, you have all these great devices and all these great treatments and injectables and everything else that you happen to offer. And then what you see happening is you see 5, 10, 15, 20 practices in the exact same market using the exact same website content, using the exact same brochures, using the exact same collateral inside of the practice. And so for the patient, it's very hard to tell one option from another. And then you have medical marketing companies that do the exact same thing, right? They're very good at implementing tactics, whether it's SEO or digital marketing or, you know, some kind of call inbound campaign, whatever the case happens to be. But they don't have any strategy or any branding affinity, so they'll have all these clients in a very close geographic proximity, and their marketing looks almost identical, right? It's a real challenge, and it's something we want to always, you know, avoid and try to overcome wherever possible. So these five factors have really created that, you know, that perfect storm <laughs> of commoditization, right? Another challenge is, you know, you know, I don't know how many art aficionados we have on the line with us today, but, you know, I always say many practices are marketing like a Monet when they should be marketing like a Mondrian. And I'm going to explain what I mean here, right? On the left, we have London Fog by Monet. And this is how most practices market in the sense that, you know, you can kind of see what's happening from a distance, but the closer up you get to look at things in detail, it's somewhat of a blur, right? There's a structure, but it really is quite hazy the more you think about it. Um, and it's just not incredibly clear at all what's to be done, how it's being done, or for whom it's being done, or by whom for that matter. On the right, we have a Mondrian, right? Everything is very organized. It's very structured and sequential. It's incredibly clear, right? We want to create a situation where your marketing is done without guesswork, right? You're not coming into the practice on Monday morning and speaking with your team and saying, you know, hey guys, I don't think we've been, you know, having many patients in for cool sculpting lately. Let's do a cool sculpting email campaign this week, right? That's not what we want. We want there to be an underpinning strategy to all of your marketing so we eliminate that guesswork. So that's what we're going to move towards today. The next thing I want to mention, you know, when we look at what is the solution to really lackluster marketing that makes your practice out to be a commodity, and the answer to that is it's all about branding. And I'm going to give you an example, right? There are commodities in every industry, right? Three of my favorite examples are a glass of water is, is pretty much free, right? A polo shirt, if you buy that at your department store, is maybe between $30 and $50. 
and, you know, a cup of coffee, depending, you know, if you make it at home or you have a Keurig machine at the office, whatever the case happens to be, is, you know, maybe a dollar or two. But when we add branding into that picture, all of a sudden the conversation becomes dramatically different, right? When we add the Starbucks logo to that cup of coffee, it goes from being a dollar or two to maybe five, six, possibly more, depending how fancy you like to get with your caffeinated beverages every day, um, right? If we look at a polo shirt, adding a Nike check mark or my personal favorite, the Lacoste alligator to that same shirt, it goes from being, you know, 40 or $50 to well over a hundred, right? So branding just completely changes that. And of course, water is probably my favorite example of branding and positioning at play, right? H2O is the exact same chemical compound, no matter where you happen to get it, whether it's from Evian, whether it's from Dasani, whether you're buying it from, you know, a store or getting it from the tap, right? But the prices vary dramatically. And if you go to any supermarket, you'll see an aisle full of water, right? And different brands, and they all sell well. And there may be some very different taste discrepancies between brands, but ultimately it is the exact same chemical compound, right? That good old H2O, right? So branding completely changes the equation when it comes to your pricing uh, issues and really the conversation on price. So that said, let's get started. Let's talk about how we can really transform your marketing, right? Let's talk about how we can accelerate your practice. So the first thing I want to cover as a foundation is what is branding in the first place, right? So a lot of people think it's a logo, but it's actually so much more for that than that, right? A brand is really the sum of how patients see, perceive, and experience your practice, right? It's really that real estate you own in the mind of a prospective and existing patient alike, right? So the way you answer your phone is a reflection of your brand. Your patient outcomes are part of your brand, right? Your visual identity and website most certainly are part of your brand, right? The way that you greet patients during consultations, how you conduct your follow-ups, every engagement you have with a patient, no matter how big or small, really impacts your brand, right? So always think of it as an all-encompassing experience than just, you know, a logo or a slogan or things like that. So why exactly do patients, you know, really, or as consumers even, why do patients and consumers prefer branded products, prefer to buy into brands? Let's talk about that. The first reason is branding reduces perceived risk, right? And I say that in the sense that, you know, if I go to a new country where I may not speak the native language and I see the golden arches, I'm probably going to go to McDonald's because I'm going to know roughly what the cost of my meal is going to be what it's going to look and taste like, how long it will take me to, you know, get service, what will the ambiance of that restaurant be like, right? I know what I'm in for. It reduces that uncertainty because it's a brand and that implies consistency. The second way branding matters is you are able to get more referrals and more passionate referrals, right? I love to use the example of Apple, Right. Every single year I see people around the Apple store. I am not one of them. I'm an Android user, but I see people all around the Apple store lining up to get that same phone they pretty much have already. Right. But people treat Apple almost like a religion. Right. They'll put the stickers on their backpacks, on their notebooks, on their water bottles, all of that. Right. Apple has built a brand that has created more referrals and much more passionate referrals. And we want to do the same for your practice. Now, the third benefit of branding is it really allows you to elevate your profile as a provider, right? And I mean that in two ways, whether that means you are well known for something in your local market, or maybe some of you joining us do aspire to build a much more media uh, focused brand, right? Maybe similar to what Dr. Pimple Popper has, or Dr. Miami, or the physicians you see as regular panelists on the doctor, right? On the doctors. That is all due to a strong brand that allows you to elevate your profile. And of course, a strong brand lets you attract the patients you want, right? If we think of hotels, right, you can stay at the Motel 6 or you can stay at the Ritz-Carlton. Ultimately, they're selling you the exact same thing, right? A bed and a comfortable, clean place to rest for the evening. But they attract very different sets of consumers, right? The same goes for your practice. Your brand, when done with strategy and intention, can really allow you to not only attract the patients you want, 
but also repel and kind of turn away without doing it yourself those patients that you don't want coming through your doors. So that's a really great benefit of branding. Some of you on the webinar today may be looking to transition or sell your practice, right? And if you are, a brand is going to let you get a much higher valuation at the end of the day because you have very strong intellectual property in place. So that's really important to keep in mind as well. And finally, it wouldn't be, you know, fair if I didn't mention the concept of status as it relates to branding, right? If you walk through any shopping mall and see the purses, see the handbags, see all the belts and all of that, um, there's something to be said for a brand coming with a certain status when it's built the right way. So we want to do that for your practice as well. Now, now that we understand a little bit about branding, I want to get into some more tangible elements of how do we actually really, you know, kind of clean house with your marketing and make it so much more effective than just being sporadic. The first thing I want us all to understand is how do we attract our most profitable patients, right? Your best patient should not be anyone with a wrinkle on their forehead and a checkbook anyone with, you know, saggy body parts and money to spend, right? our profile of our best patient needs to be much more well-defined than that. So let's talk about that, right? I think a golden rule that I would love for all of you to take away from this webinar is not everyone is going to be your best patient. And that is perfectly fine, right? If you were to think back over the past six months, the past year of seeing patients, ask yourself, who were your VIP clientele, right? And when I say VIP, I mean those patients that are not questioning you on price. They follow proper post care so they get good results, right? They are gladly telling all of their friends about you. And if you had a practice full of patients like this, you would just be happy as could be, right? They really do make work a pleasure for you. Conversely, I want you to think about who were your learning opportunities, <laughs> as I like to call them. These are those individuals who, of course, you know, you do your best work for them and you do everything you can to satisfy them. But if they never walked through your doors again after their treatment, you probably wouldn't be too disappointed, right? So those individuals who maybe weren't ideal clientele for your practice. Think for a moment about what your VIPs had in common. And then looking at your, you know, your less ideal patients or your learning opportunities, what exactly did they, they have in common, right? Once you take a look at that, we're going to really want to understand your VIPs in as much detail as we can so we can attract more of them. Now, a bit of a hesitation I hear from some providers when I talk about really pinpointing your target audiences is they say, well, we don't want to exclude anybody. And I completely understand that, but I want to challenge you with the concept of, you know, if you are trying to be everything to everyone, ultimately you're not going to mean much of anything to anybody, right? If you're trying to be everything to everyone, you're not going to be much of anything to anybody. And if you think about, you know, a dartboard for a second, which you'll see in the background, we want all of your marketing to go for that bullseye, right? That ideal patient, right? That individual who is best suited to your services and procedures. Now, will every single person who responds to your marketing be a mirror image of your very best patient and, you know, who you aspire to attract? No. But if we can aspire to that bullseye in all of our messaging, all of our communications, our social media, our paid advertising, we're going to get as many prospects as we can as close to that bullseye as possible. So we always want to aim for our best patient and the patients that walk through our doors will be as close to that as possible, you know, as an outcome. So think of it in the kind of context of a dartboard with a bullseye right in the middle. That's always what we're aiming for. Now, a few things you want to include when you're defining your best patient. In the world of marketing, by the way, this is known as a buyer persona, and it was first developed in the retail industry. And based on the results it got there, it quickly extrapolated to marketing at large, right? So we call it a patient profile here at Branding MD. In the world of marketing at large, you may know of this as a patient, or I'm sorry, a buyer persona. So some of the things we want to look at and some of the things we want to include are demographics, right? Age, gender, income, geographic distance from the practice, right? Marriage status. Are they single? Are they in a relationship, right? Demographics are very important to consider first and foremost. 
We also want to look at activities and behaviors, right? What's going on in your patient's lives? Are they career professionals? Are they maybe younger, uh, working part-time, or perhaps students? Are they retired? Are they, you know, stay-at-home moms and dads, right? Who are your best patients and what's going on in their lives, right? The way we look at that is not only in terms of what they're actually doing, but what brands they engage with. What cars are they driving? Where do they shop for clothing? When they go on vacation, what resort companies are they staying with and what destinations are they choosing? When it comes to your marketing, we want to look at that because we need to get outside of this industry, right? And what I mean by that is we need to draw examples from other brands in other product sectors where your patients are making purchases and use that to inspire our marketing, right? Our goal in doing all of this is for your marketing to be so resonant that when your best patient picks up your brochure or comes across your website or hears a radio ad or sees an ad on Facebook, whatever the case happens to be, um, they say, wow, this practice understands me. This practice is, you know, the right fit for my needs. So that's our goal in doing all of this. Next, we want to look at dreams and expectations, right? What not only are they hoping to get from coming into your practice and having a treatment, but what are they hoping to achieve in their lives overall, right? Are they looking to advance in their careers? Are, you know, after taking care of their children, are they looking to finally do something for themselves? Um, are they of a certain age but still very vivacious and want to look as good as they feel, right? What dreams and expectations do your best patients have going on in their lives? And what dreams and expectations do they have as it pertains to what your practice can do for them? You also want to look at decision criteria, right? Why would someone say yes or why would someone say no to a procedure at your practice? Are they worried about downtime? Are they worried about pricing? Are they worried about discomfort during the procedure? Are they worried about not looking natural at the end of their treatment, right? What concerns and decision criteria would make someone say yes or no to a procedure at your practice? Finally, we want to understand how we meet their needs, right? What can your practice do to better serve patients? than other competitors, whether they're right next door or on the other side of town. What unique attributes and advantages do you bring to the table for your best patient? Now, one thing that's important to mention is as you consider these criteria, don't think that your practice can only have one profile of a best patient, right? It may be that you have somewhere between two and four types of ideal patients who come to your practice, perhaps for different types of procedures, but we want to target all of them and we want to make sure our marketing is really well defined to resonate with them. Now, a little bit more on this whole idea of, you know, who your best patients are. We also want to look at their patient journey and we can really define this in three phases, right? Awareness, consideration, and decision. When people come across your advertising, they could be in any one of these three phases. Statistically, we know about 3% of people are in the decision phase, about 50 to 60% are in the consideration phase, and about 30% are in the awareness phase. Now, those numbers are going to vary a bit depending on what study you reference and what expert you ask, but generally we know only about 3% are in the decision phase. The rest is divided between awareness and consideration. So awareness is someone knows they have a condition, right? Maybe it's acne scars. Maybe it's, you know, sagging under eyes. Maybe they're concerned with wrinkles on their forehead. Whatever the case happens to be, they know what their concerns are, but they don't know the solutions that are out there, right? So they really need to be educated about their condition and what the solutions could be. And then they need to be really driven to action by encouraged to take the appropriate next step. Right? So for someone who's in the awareness phase, just researching right now what's wrong, they could read a blog post to be educated. Maybe you have a patient guide. Maybe there's a coupon or a voucher on your website you can offer. Or maybe there's some video testimonials about you know people with that condition. Those are all great, what we call in marketing, calls to action for your best patient in the awareness phase. Next, we have the consideration phase. And at this point, someone knows what their solutions are, but they don't know which solution is best and they don't know who's best to provide it for them, right? So maybe, you know, if they have some excess fat 
around their midsection, they're comparing, you know, cool sculpting to something like liposuction, right? They're looking at potential providers and looking at potential treatment solutions. So in this part of the equation, at this point in the patient's journey, it's our job to distinguish your practice and really demonstrate the value that you bring to the table. And some great ways we can encourage action at this phase of the journey is asking patients to read your testimonials, read your patient stories. Maybe you have reviews on Google or Yelp or RealSelf, whatever the case happens to be, but encouraging a patient to review those. Review those reviews, say that 10 times fast, right? And then at this point, it's also great to drive people to your before and after galleries. And we know with our clients all across the board, if we look at their before and after galleries, those are some of the most highly trafficked pages of their entire website. So we really do want to make sure that's very robust. Finally, we have the decision phase, right? People are ready to buy. They have a short listed set of providers, but they're not sure who they're going to yet. So at this point in this journey, we really need to become their first choice. We need to get them into the practice, right? So encouraging people to join an upcoming event is a great call to action for this. Encouraging them to schedule a free of charge or complimentary consultation is a great call to action here. Or again, just telling them to call your patient concierge, right? Call your front desk. That's a great call to action in the decision phase. So we need to make sure we have marketing that addresses and serves patients at every single point of their journey. Everyone with me so far, any questions, feel free to let me know here in the chat box. Um, but knowing who our best patients are, how do we ensure they're going to actually notice your practice, right? How do we position your practice uniquely? Now, this is a very, very in-depth topic that we do extensive consulting around when we visit a practice on site or we have them in one of our virtual training programs. But I do want to give you those first steps today. So... Again, this is all about branding and building your brand, right? They need to choose your practice for the unique advantages it offers and not just on price. And when you have a brand, it becomes very easy for you to do that, much more easily done than it would be if you didn't, right? So there's a book I want to recommend to all of you. It's called Blue Ocean Strategy. And this talks about all about how we can create what we call uncontested market space. And let me give you the analogy here, right? So most industries, and definitely medical aesthetics, are kind of what we call red oceans, right? Everyone is trying to attract the same type of patient with the same style of marketing, using the same procedures, and the same kind of look and feel to everything. And it's almost like a, an ocean full of sharks who are out for blood, right? A red ocean. But a blue ocean is one where you stand alone you offer something that your competitors can't touch, right? Something very, very unique. That is what the Blue Ocean Strategy is all about. This is a little chart of how it all works in detail. Now, I'm going to summarize this by saying, even though we do want to create a unique market space for you, we can't deny the reality that people do shop around for cosmetic procedures, right? So between the Blue Ocean and the red ocean, we have what I call the distinct practice in the middle. And that's all about differentiating your practice by adding value and adding something unique to the picture, right? So again, it's added value as a means of differentiation. Now, oh, I'm going to go back one slide here for a moment. Great. So another thing I would encourage you when it comes to positioning your practice are two words never to use in your vocabulary, right? The first is discount and the second is free, right? Both of these only really diminish the value that you bring to the table and encourage patients to shop on price. Now, I'm not saying don't run promotions. In fact, I love very well-structured promotions. But what I am telling you is just to change how we are positioning it a little bit, right? Instead of discount, let's use the word savings or incentive, right? When I hear discount, I think of like fruit on sale at the market that's like about to turn that evening and they need to sell it, right? That's what discount makes me think of. And instead of saying free, because there is no value in free, I'm going to say that. There is no value in something free, right? 
use the word complementary. It's a very small change, but it makes a world of difference, right? Free is what people do with their junk before they move so they can get rid of it, right? They put that on the sidewalk with like a piece of cardboard <laughs> with free scrawled on there with a marker, right? If you go to the Ritz-Carlton, something is offered to you complimentary, right? So it's a very small change, but it makes a world of difference. Now, another way I want you to look at your positioning is as it relates to what I call the value equation, right? Whoop, sorry, guys, my slides are getting ahead of me. There we go. So the value equation is where, right, every product, every treatment, every procedure on offer in your practice has a cost associated, right? There's also a perceived benefit that comes with every single one of those procedures, right? Every single one of those skincare products, every single one of those treatments, Whenever the value to the buyer is greater than the total cost based on what the perceived benefit is, that neutralizes price objection, right? So you have a perceived benefit compared to the cost, and the difference between the cost and the perceived benefit is what that value to the buyer is. So I would encourage you to take a look at this and remember that whenever this equation is at play, you can very easily overcome price objection. Now, that's a little bit about positioning, but how do we actually communicate that positioning, right? How do we actually put that into words? Um, so the first thing I want to mention here is when I look at the way most practices describe their services and their treatments, their procedures, one of two things is happening, right? It's either so clinical that it just sounds like they're reading a textbook on your website and there's nothing that encourages and motivates that patient to take action, or you see people using these words and cliches that just have really lost meaning, right? Things like, oh, be the best you, or, you know, where science meets beauty. And that's great, but that doesn't really mean anything to people anymore, right? People are, uh, people are sick of that, and they've heard it so many times, they're kind of like, what does that even mean, right? So we always want to make sure we appeal to something much deeper than a cliche or being so scientific in our marketing that it doesn't really appeal to the emotional side. There's a quote I would love to share with you from Estee Lauder, and that is, I'm not selling a lipstick, I'm selling hope, right? So that means that she's appealing to people's emotions, which is incredibly powerful because we know and consumer psychology tells us that people make purchases based on emotion and justify those purchases with facts later. I'm going to say that one more time. People make purchases based on emotion and justify those purchases with facts later, right? So ultimately, price is a consideration but they've already made a purchasing decision in their mind, whether it's from you or a competitor, based on an emotional trigger, right? Now, there's really three angles you want to consider as you're thinking of messaging. And by the way, messaging are just is just you know a marketing term for the words we're using to describe your services on your website, on your brochures, through social media, when you're speaking on the phone to a prospect. All of that and the words you're using in any marketing communication that is messaging. So we want to consider the patient angle, we want to consider the internal angle, and we want to consider the competitive angle, right? The patient angle is quite simply, what does your patient worry about? What are they concerned with, right? We need to make sure your messaging is customer-centric. It goes back to that marketing joke that everyone is listening to the same radio station, and then that station is WIIFM, right? What is in it for me? So that's the patient angle. You want to consider that. You want to consider the internal angle, right? What message do you want to make sure that we convey to prospective patients, right? What do you say to people, whether it's on the phone, during treatment, in the consultation room? What do you say to them? And when they say, when you say it, their eyes kind of just light up, right? Those patients just get this, you know, glimmer of excitement on their face, right? Those are all things we want to include as part of the internal angle. Finally, we want to consider the competitive angle, right? What makes you different than that med spa across town? What makes you better or different than that med spa across the street, right? We want to consider all of this when we're putting your messages together. So we've got positioning, 
We've got messaging that compels people. What's the next step? We really want to look at your visual identity. And what I mean by that is it's, you know, not just your logo, but your brochures, your website, the way your practice is decorated and designed. All of this plays into your visual identity, right? And your visual identity should just reinforce what your brand is all about, right? It shouldn't just be arbitrary and based on what you like. It should always cater to the patient, right? And that's why things like butterflies and lotus flowers and, you know, silhouettes and all of this, faces, all of that loses meaning because ultimately it doesn't reinforce any particular brand promise and it doesn't give a patient or a prospective patient anything to really remember you by or take notice of. And again, like I said, if you don't stand out, you are invisible. So let me ask you, and I mean, I can't see all of you in front of me, unfortunately, but I'm sure we'll have some heads nodding. Is this what your website looks like, right? There's an airbrushed model at the top, and then you have, you know, a button for, you know, different facial areas or body areas, depending on what your practice offers, right? Like breast, face, body, skin. And then you have, you know, the doctor's headshot with some credentials and a contact form. That is all very, very commonplace, right? It's very overdone and it makes it very difficult for a patient to notice you. I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, at least some of you, you know, oh my gosh, this is exactly <laughs> what my website looks like. This is exactly what that template the medical marketing company gave me is, right? But here's the thing. If a patient is shopping around and they see four, five, six practices with websites that all are like carbon copies of one another, it's going to be very difficult for them to pick one or see what makes you different from your visual identity, right? So it needs to be differentiated. Now, there are any number of brand touch points that we can really look at improving for your visual identity. And this is just a list, right? Signage, banners, point of sale things, your website, landing pages, your email newsletter, right? Uh, your Instagram and Facebook, most definitely, right? And then, of course, your classic collateral, right? That is the logo. That is the business card and letterhead. It's the envelopes. It is the appointment reminder cards, right? It is your menus and brochures, all of that. These are all touch points that should really serve to reinforce your brand promise and all be very uniquely designed. Now, when it comes to your marketing plan, right, most practices just either don't have one or they think they have a plan, but that plan is show up on Monday morning and pick what they're going to practice that week <laughs> with their social media channels, right, and their email newsletters and all of that. We want to be very strategic with our marketing plan. We want to be much, much more specific and much, much more really intentional in how we're doing everything. So again, it's that difference between a Monet and a Mondrian, right? Everything in a Monet, right? The London Fog painting here, very, very difficult to distinguish. You know, you can kind of see what's happening, but not really. On the right with a Mondrian, it's very sequential. It's very organized. It's very clear and very streamlined. So I want to really help you understand mass marketing versus strategic marketing, because this is the first place most practices make a mistake, right? Oh, let me go back there. There we go. So with mass marketing, this is billboards and radio advertisement and television and, you know, being in a magazine. And there's nothing wrong with any of that, right? But these are mass marketing tactics, right? Our goal is to get as many leads as possible with a broad message, right? We're really catering to the masses here. Um, it's all about how many numbers can we get exposure to, how many prospects can we gather for the widest range of procedures, right? We know this in marketing as brand awareness advertising, right? So again, this is your television. This is your radio ads. This is your billboard, all of that. We also have strategic marketing, and this is quite a bit different, right? This is where we are going after a very specific audience through very specific channels with a very targeted message, right? It's much more like using a fine paintbrush than a can of spray paint, right? That's the analogy I like to use, right? And our focus here is conversion, right? It's all about generating consultations and the quality of your leads, right? It's not just about how many people can we get to call us. It's about how many of the right prospects can we get to learn more about our services. 
with this, because we're generally looking to book consultations, um, we can see ROI much quicker, right? Strategic marketing is things like Facebook ads. It's a very targeted event, right? Maybe you're hosting it or maybe you're sponsoring one. Both of those are very strategic marketing avenues. It's a well-designed referral program, right? It's about selecting the right ways to market both online and offline and not just doing this, you know, quote unquote stuff to see how much, you know, patient traffic and, you know, how many people we can get in touch with. Um, I always tell practices often they might need a marketing make under, right? And what I mean by that is it's all about doing less, but doing it very, very well. I would much rather see a practice doing five or six things to promote themselves than 40 that, you know, they're all done with half effort and nothing looks professional and nothing is executed flawlessly, right? It's just, you know, kind of throwing things into the air, like I said earlier, and seeing what holds, right? So this is much more intentional. And again, it's all about quality prospects interested in your most profitable procedures. So again, there's nothing wrong with either one of these approaches, but for most growing practices, strategic marketing is going to be the best use of your effort and mass marketing would be better, you know, as you kind of head into that million dollar plus mark, that $2 million plus mark in revenue, and you have the budget and the bandwidth to cast a bit of a wider net. So that's how strategic marketing differs from mass marketing. Now, the next thing I want to help you understand when it comes to being strategic in your marketing is we always want to work backwards from a quantifiable objective, right? We're not just throwing mud at the wall <laughs> and seeing what sticks, you know, let's go spend two grand on a Facebook campaign and see how it performs, right? None of that. We always want to work backwards from a quantifiable objective, right? So for example, if our goal is based on sales at the practice, we want to know how many consultations it needs to get to that number and how many website visits will get us that number of consultations, how many Facebook followers, right, for it as an example, would get us that number of website visits, or how many paid advertising impressions would get us that number of website visits, right? So it's all about starting at the top as in your goal and working backwards from your goal, right? This is much more strategic and a much more sequential way of looking at it. Now, I understand many of you probably don't have all of this information. You don't have all these analytics, and that's okay. But this is eventually want, what we want to work towards. So we're never doing things in a sense of just, you know, guesswork, right? So you really do need to know your numbers and know them so well that you can work backwards when it comes to putting together an advertising budget. Now, as a general rule of thumb, you wanna be spending between five to 10% of your annual revenue on marketing and advertising. If you're looking to grow or you're a brand new practice, it might be a little bit closer than 12 to 15, but five to 10 as a general benchmark of how much you should be spending on marketing overall during the course of a year, and then if you're a new practice or very aggressively growing, 12 to 15 is probably a better, a better indication. Now let's look at your marketing plan in three phases. You can use the analogy ACE, A-C-E, attract, convert, and engage, right? As we do all of this activity, you know, Facebook ads, radio ads, referral programs, you're doing events, right? All of this marketing activity, whatever it is, it's designed to do one of two things. People are either going to call you at the front desk or they're going to visit your website, right? They then go from being random onlookers, right? Strangers to viable leads for your practice. We call that the attract phase. And that's the first phase of your marketing plan. The second phase is called convert. And this is all about, right, two things, because in the sense of conversion, and we have to do it twice when it comes to medical aesthetics. We first have to convert people to book a consultation, and we then have to book people to go from a consultation to a scheduled procedure, right? So conversion is all about using patient education and the right approaches to get people from prospect to consultation, from consultation to on your schedule, right? So that's what the convert phase is all about. Now, whether someone says during consultation, they want to move ahead, whether they say they need time to think about it or they're unsure, or whether they say no, 
we want to encourage them to keep in touch with us long term and build that relationship, right? This is very similar in a sense to the patient journey, right? So we engage them if they say yes and they become a patient by getting their reviews, getting them to come back, getting them to send their friends. If they say they're unsure, we can use engagement to really educate them on the procedure more. So in, you know, four, six, eight months, when they are ready, maybe even sooner, they come back to your practice. Even if they say they aren't interested in a procedure right now or a treatment, that's perfectly fine. We still keep in touch with them. And an email newsletter, by the way, is a great avenue for this. So when they are ready in six, 12, 18 months, or they know somebody else who is, they think of you and don't go to one of your competitors. Now, unfortunately, we're getting to the end of our time, but I do want to let you know that these are your marketing channels for each phase of the marketing plan. Now, I would never tell you to do all of these at once. We would all run out of money and run out of time and probably run out of sanity, to be quite honest with you, right? What I would suggest is pick three to four channels in both the attract and convert and engagement phase. So three to four channels in each phase, master them, get them to work for you effectively, and then add more on, right? What this marketing combination of channels will look like for a practice in, right, a smaller town of say 20,000 is way different than what it would look like for a practice, you know, that's doing $4 million a year in a major metropolitan city, right? Marketing is not one size fits all, right? It's based on your market geographically. It's based on who your best patients are. It's based on what financial resources we have available. And it's based on who your best patients are, right? If your best patients are, you know, young to mid 20 somethings, that's going to be a very different marketing plan than a practice who's trying to attract 55 plus maybe for, you know, facial procedures, right? So there's variables at play in this, right? where you're located, who you're serving, what your budget is, and what you're looking to accomplish. But this is kind of a big list that over-encompasses everything. Again, attract, convert, and engage. Great. Now, a few key considerations with your marketing, and they should all be around ROI, right? When you invest your time or financial resources into marketing, what are you seeing back for that? What does it cost you to get a patient? We call that patient acquisition cost. And what would it be worth to you to develop a campaign strategically that reduces your marketing spend, right? Because it's going to convert better. That saves you the time and frankly, the headaches of ineffective marketing and really helped you, you know, get five new patients a month, 10 new patients a month. What would that be worth to you, right? When you think about all of this and think in the frame of ROI, it makes it much more evident where your marketing priorities should lie. So that is pretty much how we're going to spring clean your marketing. And again, we only had an hour, but I hope you got some very tangible first steps, got some very tangible insights, and can really take this back to your team and begin to put it into action, right? It's about researching your market, knowing your competitors, knowing your audience, and knowing the importance of that and why you need to stand out, right? Why we need to profile your patients, why we need to define what makes you different, why we need to position you correctly, how we can create a message that, again, appeals to emotion and doesn't sound too clinical and doesn't rely on a cliche. And again, we want a visual identity that looks unique and compelling to your best patients, right? I always say, you can't sell beauty looking like a beast. And finally, we want to market your practice strategically, right? No more just doing quote unquote stuff. We want to be much more intentional than that and pick the right marketing channels for your practice and then execute those channels based on a quantifiable objective. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is a little bit about how you spring clean your marketing and how you can start to get on the path of really being much more strategic in how you promote your practice. So how do we go about doing that? Um, I'd love to learn more about your practice and share some tips with you, share some individual insights, right? I know all of your practice situations might be quite different. So 
I would love to, you know, get to know you better. Um, I've put 12 spots on my schedule in the next week between my travels and uh, some on-site client visits. But if you'd like to discuss your challenges in a bit more detail, feel free to message our team, discover at brandingmd.co, zoom us an email, and we'll learn more about your practice and get a time on the calendar for us to chat. And we can explore what the potential for your practice might be. And if there's some solutions that are the right fit, great. I'd love to tell you more about those. So feel free to reach out to us, discover at brandingmd.co. That's also the email address you're going to want to use to, again, get a copy of today's slides and the digital edition of my book, Now the Patient Will See You, which takes this into much greater depth. So feel free to reach out to us at discover at brandingmd.co, right? We'll also be happy to send you those complimentary materials. And I would just love to know if there's any questions anything you're wondering, anything at all, um, feel free to let me know. I am here to be of service to you. What did you like most about this webinar? What questions do you have? What wasn't clear? Uh, what new ideas had this sparked for you? I'm open to any and all of your feedback. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today, everyone. I loved sharing this insight with all of you. I am so excited to discover how you put this into action for your practice. And by the way, I'm giving you my personal mobile number here. Uh, feel free to reach out. Feel free to give me a call and ask me any questions you have. Again, I am here to be a resource to you. So thank you so much once again for your time today. And I hope you have a great rest of your day, hopefully putting these insights into action. Thanks so much, everyone, and take care for now. Bye-bye.